think I'm going to use this interval between segments while we wait for Phil to get in um, I'm an invite. To, to plug um, what all we have over at Astro Gear a popsicle. Um, have another popsicle. <laughs> oh, now I can't, that one's mine. Wait, now I can't invite Phil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, if you want to physically show your support for us by walking around wearing stuff, um, and these are perfect to paint in the astro um, painting thing that we're going to be doing tomorrow. We have astronomy cast t-shirts that show a logarithmic scale of the universe going all the way out to the cosmic microwave background. We have I am CosmoQuest t-shirts, which Nicole and I will both be wearing at some point. Um, we and then have... I have to wash again to wear for the professional development later on. Yeah, next well, that week. happens. <laughs> Um, we have uh, the composition of the moon is uh, <laughs> um, cheesy, basically, t-shirts. And then we have the famous cosmology, it only gets better with age t-shirt. And don't forget the beautiful, full color, 365 days of astronomy t-shirt. Um, if you buy these shirts, uh, shipping in the U.S. is included. There's an extra box you have to check to buy things shipped international. Everything's getting shipped out flat rate priority mail. And Tim, her significant other, is set to ship things out as the orders come in this weekend. Um, the money from this goes to support paying for our servers. Um, and it's just another way that you can help keep CosmoQuest going. And uh, your donations are, of course, uh, what will allow us to build more citizen science projects, um, allow us to pay our programmers. We are up to 3% of our goal. We're up to $5,421. So you have paid and insured one of my staff members for one month. Um, so that, that's something. Um, <laughs> so that's a month's rent, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, so that that's all the salary, and food and whatnot. all of the medical insurance. Um, yeah, so help, donate. I'm gonna eat a popsicle. popsicle. Uh, so we're waiting for Phil to come in, and he's I am here. Really? Oh no, he's he's commenting the YouTube page. Phil, I sent you an invite. Um, or oh, Phil's in the green room. Good. Uh, Tim, uh, send Phil along. I think you have the link already. Uh, plus, he has an invite. So send him in when he's ready. Um, meanwhile, I'm seeing all kinds of image links coming up in the comments. <laughs> so we're, I'm going to take a look and see what you guys have been up to. <laughs> uh, let's see. We have Science is Cool. Um... <laughs> There's Kushimis. <laughs> So uh, here is here is a possible meme picture of Bill. <laughs> Are you looking at this? So we have science is cool oh, with oh dear. Bill Plate and 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 his cat who is slightly evil. That's wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. That photo is wrong. No, I love it. I... <laughs> so there we go. There's one of the possible meme pictures. This one came from Todd Diedrich. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, of course, there is the illustration of Phil from the Skeptic Trumps card. Uh, oh, you, everybody yeah. loves this little caricature here. I'm going to screen share this. <laughs> this is how we're going to introduce Phil segment. <laughs> Show silly pictures of him. <laughs> this is Chris Benjago. Uh He did a, a series of skeptical Trump cards, and so it's, it's like a, a gaming card with his powers and his weaknesses and a really cool illustration. Um, so we've got that going as well. Oh, goodness. I'm saving that science is cool one. Uh, we have another Phil picture. <laughs> Someone's beeping in my ear. That's my husband. Oh, <laughs> wait, that's the skeptical trunk card again. Um, yeah, I think I think we... Uh... Oh, this is, this is scrolling too fast for me. Yeah. This isn't my mouse. Okay, so yeah, well, I think we're going to go with the, uh, the science is cool with the cat crotch picture. <laughs> Uh, we have a question about shipping to Denmark. Do yeah. Any, um, yes. Yeah. No. So, so we're going to send everything global priority flat rate box. It's twenty five dollars for everything that will fit in the global flat rate box. 
Um, if we can't cram everything you order into the box, we will let you know and we'll figure out how to ship it to you. So if you buy something international, um, throw everything in your cart and then also throw in the international shipping. Awesome. Um, we are not eating carbon dioxide um, ice popsicles because no. that would hurt. Uh, we don't have any dry ice on hand. I think we're all done with what we um, procured for the, uh, we had a tornado come through and a blackout and so we procured some dry ice to save our freezer. And if you put dry ice in your freezer, it not only keeps your food cold, but it freezes your freezer. We actually, <laughs> we managed to get the temperature in our freezer so low that the water that goes up to the ice cube maker, that little tube froze. Yeah, so, um, yeah, don't put dry ice in a freezer that's working, but if you have a non-working freezer and want to keep your stuff cool, uh, that, that works. Mm -hmm. um, where do we find the shop on the website? It's astrogear.org, uh, A-S-T-R-O-G-E-A-R.org, and uh, that's where you can find the stuff in the store. And uh, we have a Phil. Yay, it's Phil. He looks for, I don't know if he's frozen like that no, or I'm just kidding. frozen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never know with you. <laughs> Hello, um, I was just welcome. Just sending you a note there, Nicole, to be careful about what pictures you post. Thank you. I am being careful. Don't okay. worry. I, I, I'm not putting any calendar pictures in. There's a picture of Pamela and me on my blog today that I actually quite like. Oh, Aww. yeah. There, one of my favorite pictures is one that was taken of Phil and I. I don't know if this is the one you posted. Is it the Dragon Con picture? This one it was either Blake Smith or Maria Walters. Blake wasn't sure who took it, so I credited them both. Okay. My favorite picture of you from Dragon Con, you've got your head down and your glasses across your head. And so you just look like you have no face. <laughs> I remember that. That's mm. one of my favorite Dragon Con pictures. Uh, there are a couple of good pics of, of Pamela and me from that um, New Mexico conference a billion yeah. years ago. Yeah, so, so Phil and I go back to when he was another person doing NASA science outreach. So... You, you've been in our position. You actually survived when they tried to cancel GLAST on you. Um, I think every mission I've been on has been canceled at some point or another. <laughs> uh, that, successful. Yeah, and yeah, it doesn't matter how much money you've put into it. Um, what, you need $25 and we've spent $600 million already? No, you can't have that, that money for you know, your insulin shot, so we're going to cancel the mission. <sighs> Yeah. Well, how are you guys doing? We're doing well. It's it's been an amazing day. It's You're already punch drunk. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hot up here in the attic. Um it's in the nineties outside here in Metro East of St. Louis and oh, uh the attic. little air conditioner in the corner is cranking as hard as it can. I think we're both desperately waiting for the sun to set right now. <laughs> we may need to make the lighting set. I mean, yes, it looks good and all, but <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, you've got like four hours before the sun sets. We're almost at the solstice here, so. Yeah, I know. That's going to be a while. <laughs> so how are you doing in the fire-ravaged Colorado area? Eh, surrounded. The the big fire in Colorado Springs, there are two of them down there. Those That's way south of me, and there's one burning in the Rockies, but I don't know. I don't know how bad that one is today. I haven't checked, but that one's also. I could see some smoke from it yesterday, and, uh, <laughs> you know, always a scientist. I was looking for it thinking, you know, it should be above the horizon. I should be able to just catch it. And then yesterday as we were driving, um, I could see there are clouds everywhere, and some of the clouds look funny. And there was a layer above one cloud, and that, that thin layer was really um, a very light blue. And yeah. I thought, oh, that's going to be smoke scattering the sunlight from the fire. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'm, I'm seeing, actually, the smoke from the Rocky Mountain fire. And I remember seeing that. Was it, gosh, was it last year? Yeah, last year when there was a fire here in Boulder and the plume kind of kind of went due west and then blew north and it kind of went over my house. And when you looked at it in different spots from different angles where the sun was, you could see it looked gray, it looked red, it looked blue, depending on how the sunlight was hitting it and coming through. So, you know, it was a great lesson in atmospheric optics, but not one I really needed to see. Yeah, it's when it's too close to home like that. Yeah. And that, that's one of the... the powers and frustrations at the same time of, of understanding anything is um, you can start to understand the consequences and um, there's people that say ignorance is bliss but hey at least those with the knowledge have time to prepare and, yeah, ignorance, uh, the people who say ignorance is bliss are ignorant and wrong 
Um, so yeah, you could die in a forest fire. So let's <laughs> not have that happen. It, you know what? Um, actually, in last year, because of the fires, I learned about the word pyrocumulus, mm, which is that rising hot air, that plume of smoke that looks like a cumulus cloud. I didn't even know that was a word, so I learned that. And um, also, uh, from some of the pictures, the plume was very white, and I thought, oh. That must be steam. Well, where's the steam coming from? Well, it must be yeah. from the firefighters with the water. And then I got a note from an old friend of mine uh, back when I worked in California who said, no, dum-dum, that's from the trees burning. They're organic. And what happens when you burn organic material? You get carbon dioxide and water, and that water turns into steam. And I was like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, turns out he was right. So, you know, science. <laughs> oh, science wow. Oh, my gosh. So you've had a crazy walk through your career where you have gone from a uh, astronomer working at Goddard on supernovae to science educator working at Sonoma State on Swift and now Fermi. Uh, it was called Glast back then. Uh, to now you're a science communicator who does the whole TV thing and writes books and <laughs> it's not the whole TV thing. It's a <laughs> little TV thing. You had your yeah. own show. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but it's you have this very complete perspective on what what goes in to trying to get science out to the public and how much all of us who do it have to fight and watching you because you're you're ahead of me in 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 career and I get to nip at your heels and try and catch up. But it's, it's been wild to watch how you had to fight when you were doing NASA programming to always try and get the new funding. You had to fight when you were a researcher to always get the next grant. And now you have to fight to try and find the publisher, the network. And all along the way, it seems that there's been people trying to say no. Right. Just no. So what keeps you going? Uh, the money, mostly. Um, no, uh, that's there is a, no money. Point. The way you phrased it, whenever anybody synopsizes my life, I think, man, that sounds actually like that's really cool. That doesn't sound like the stuff I did. It's like, oh wait, no, I did do that. But you know, now I'm a blogger. Hey. <laughs> um, but you're right. Um, there's always been a fight for trying to get that next grant or trying to find the next. Try basically trying to uh, pole vault over the latest gatekeeper. Uh, there's always somebody standing between you and what you want, and uh, typically, typically they're not the people with the actual funding. They're people between you and the people with the funding. Yeah. Uh, when I was in grad school, that wasn't as big a problem because you have advisors who help you with that. Um, but then, uh, when I worked at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, we had funding for four years. Our camera that went up on Hubble. You know that that money was guaranteed by NASA, so that was okay. Although there was there were other projects I was doing, and and we wound up you know getting grants for that. Um, but then once I moved out to Sonoma State University, and was working on the education and public outreach of like you said, Swift, Fermi, New Star, XMM Newton, Chandra. Um, good heavens, I'd have to you know I I, I can't even remember all. We we were constantly looking for money, constantly filling out proposals. And to my horror, I found out I was good at writing proposals. Um, that's not a skill you want. Cheers. Um, yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, because then everybody wants you to write the proposals, and it's just a horrifying process. I, you could, I could hyphenate a word like nobody's business. You know, we're going to be proactive with inquiry-based, web-driven... Uh, you know, it, it, all of these buzzwords that always have a, a, a dash in them. And that was, that was uh, horrifying. I mean, you, you, it was, it's kind of like the situation NASA's in all the time. They're given a certain amount of money to do stuff, but it's not enough money to do it right. So there's always this sort of background money that was there, but it was never enough to do what we needed to do. So we're constantly, you know, filling out the, 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 applications for for 15 grand here and 50 there and the application for 15 grand and the application for 2 million is the same length that's right that was Lynn Kaminsky I don't know if she ever talked to you about that but she said that she's like you know I could get 20 grand or I could get 3 million and uh, you know and it's 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 just three pages of stuff that you have to write um, the problem is of course you have to find that that opportunity 
And uh, the, re the real thing is, um, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And it's a different mindset. You know, I, somebody says, you know, you're applying for $50,000. And I'm thinking, $50,000. And then when you look at how that gets spent, it's like, yeah, we're going to have $4.18 left when we're done uh, with salaries and overhead and everything. And it, it turns out, yeah, 50 grand does not go very far. That'll pay somebody's salary. Once, once the university takes their half and everything else, that's, that's like four months of salary, and that's not much time to get done what you want to get done. And, and that's actually one of the awesome things about this fundraiser that we're doing right now is donations escape the university overhead. So when we oh, put nice. in a grant proposal, um, there's a lot of record keeping, there is a lot of accounting, there is a lot of reporting that the university has to do to the federal government. And they have to pay people to do all of this reporting. So if I ask for $100,000 for my project, I have to actually bring in $143,000, and 43000 goes to the university to pay the salaries of the people who do yeah, all of this reporting. <laughs> but with this project, the funding comes in through what's called the foundation. It's, it's the office that handles donations. The money comes in, and all of it goes straight to doing CosmoQuest. So... If we're able to bring in $100,000, we can turn all of that into doing new programs for CosmoQuest. Right. And actually... Oop. We can hear you, Phil. Oh. Yeah, suddenly my sound clicked out. I just realized um, I, I, I need to tweet for people to send you money. And also... <laughs> See, CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Go ahead and tweet that. There you go. I just um, tweeted it. Let me make sure... We have another meme picture that is totally safe for work, but really awesome. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just oh, hang on, hang on. I you gotta, can't stop me. <laughs> I need 37 more windows open. Here we go. All right, go I ahead. I know how you feel. Let's see uh, it. <laughs> uh, is this the one? Yes. Science. This one is, instead of science is cool, we have science is hot. And so maybe you know what picture this is. Uh-oh. So, oh, there you go. Awesome. That's your meme, folks. Science That's, is hot. <laughs> Send was, it around. That was here in Boulder a few years ago at the Conference on World Affairs, which is a Who big... did that? Brian Brusher, did you how to do that? No. Who taught you how to eat fire? This, was, this conference is um, this hoity-toity conference where they invite all kinds of, you know, uh, not uh, well, celebrities, but politicians, writers, musicians, everybody sort of at the top of their game. And they bring them all, bring them all in. Seth Shostak, you can ask him about that. He's he's done it many years. I see him here sometimes. Uh, and um, there are different panels talking about. Stuff. And there's a party uh, every night, and it's really a lot of fun. And I was at that party, and they, um, who was it? Um, of course, I'm blanking on the name. But there were a couple of people there who were who were fire eaters, and they showed us how to do it, and it was actually quite easy. And somebody snapped that picture of me, and it was just exactly right as I pulled the thing off my tongue. And I, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a, a blog post about it, basically saying, "Don't screw with me because I eat fire." Uh, so that's a, that's a great one. Um, here, if you want another one, here, here, I'll, I'll meme you. Here. Oh wait, you're allowed to oh. show it. I've been allowed to show it for years. It turns oh, out. Oh, if I do it again, I have your screen in focus now. Okay, I got all excited. Got so there you go. Screen. Speaking yeah. of fiery death. <laughs> <Sure. That's your laughs> I hope y'all got a screenshot just now. It's the fiery death <laughs> that tattoo. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, actually, that was my last uh, post on Discover Magazine before I moved to Slate. Oh, that's I revealed right. Oh, the tattoo right. Right. That was a whole nightmare because the TV, I did it for LA Inc. It was it was because of a bet with my CEO at Discover. We were going to get tattoos if we got a certain amount of traffic to the blogs and everything. And then I went on LA Inc. They filmed it. They put it online and then never aired it on television. And I could never get permission to post it. Yeah. And they were, they, oh. see, and, and this, this goes back to, to, to what we were talking about before, Pamela. They're gatekeepers. They're people who are in between you and what you want to do. And, you know, I, I would talk to people at, at the Learning Channel, um, n not against the Learning Channel, but they're just, you know, there's always these people in your way. And there was, you know, one or two people who were like, oh, yeah, we'll see if we can get, get you permission to air that. And then nothing ever happened. And, and yeah. you know, I'd been told up to that point, do not talk about this. And so I couldn't do anything until finally somebody said, oh, yeah, sure, you can, yeah, do whatever you want. Go ahead. It's like, really? It's been three years. So, and it's, it's still true now. Um, you know, working with Discovery Channel to make Bad Universe, you were talking about, Nicole, 
making a television show is really hard. Yeah. And there's a lot I'm really proud of about, about Bad Universe. And there were some things that we kind of had to do in a real hurry that when they got on screen, I kind of went, uh. and And dealing with all the layers of everybody and having to go through, you know, there's the, the production company and the, the network and this and that and the other thing. It's never, you never quite get what you want. And with publishers, it's the same way. Um, you know, they want to do it this way and that way, and I don't want to do it that way, but I don't have a choice because I've signed a contract. Right. So now I just I want to do stuff on my own. Um, I can't talk about it yet, <laughs> but I have something that will be coming out very soon that I did with a friend of mine. That's and awesome. we, I just basically went on Twitter, and he was doing something on Twitter, and I said, I want in. And he said, okay, and we did it. Boom, and it's hopefully it'll be available by uh, by July, uh, by Comic Con is when we want to get this out. Oh, but that's awesome. We'll talk about that later. But that was totally us. We can do whatever we want. We made sure that we weren't uh, stepping over any lines or you know being rude or you know set people off because you make a joke that winds up being off color or something like that. But it's it's us. You know, if if there's a mistake made, it's us. If I make a mistake, you know, damn it, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It's not going to be 13 layers deep with somebody I can't, you know, even get a hold of and say I need to say something about this. And um, and this is this is part of one of the things that I'm really loving with how science and society is actually changing. Is it used to be if you wanted to launch a spacecraft, you had to wait to get selected by NASA. You had to wait to get selected by the European Space Agency. You had to wait, and you had to compete. And you had to tweak your mission to fit exactly what other people were looking for, even if that wasn't the best science you felt could be done. But now, with crowdfunding, with the commercial space race, and with the advances in technology, we can generally say, I want to do foo. Will you join me? And we can build our own future. And you see this happening on Kickstarter. And, and this goes along the lines of, of um, something Zach Braff you recently said in a Kickstarter he did to raise money for a sequel to Garden State, where he could work with um, a, a major film agency, but then if he said he wanted so-and-so to be in the movie, they might come along and say, no, we want someone famous. And here at CosmoQuest, we love working with NASA. We will continue working with NASA as long as we can. But we are granted certain freedoms through crowdsourcing that allows us to accelerate the process, that allows us to say, um, instead of waiting three years for the funding that might come from NASA, will you help today and we'll build that project tomorrow. And, which and might so we're able a week before to expecting. accelerate the timeline. What were you saying, Phil? I'm sorry, I, didn't, I thought you would stop for a second. And I said, and that funding might get yanked a week before you, you, know, you expect it to come yeah. in, say. Like it's right it's good to work with the big organizations. You do get some good things, you know, working with the distribution. university. You get distribution. A you get a yeah. ho home. You know, we have our offices and our buildings and, and uh, resources at the university as well. But, uh, yeah, there are different ways to go about it. And, and you've been doing a lot of work writing about the funding situation and the people on the Hill who are making the decisions about sun about science funding in America and I'd love it if you could talk well I wouldn't love it but I think we need to learn about what is it that's happening when we see evolution getting removed from schools what is it that's happening when we see people trying to change the rules for the National Science Foundation and such <laughs> um, Boy, that's a good one first let me say Nicole Carolyn Porco just tweeted asking a question about something if you want to take a look oh at I, I know what that is that's okay, okay. yeah um, I'll respond I, to that while, while you talk. It's funny because I saw that come up just as I was thinking about her because she, she talks about how her whole career, you know, right after Voyager was on Cassini. And, you know, she, she got on there early and even after it launched, it was still many years to get to Saturn. Now it's been at Saturn for, oh, I can never remember when Saturn orbital insertion was. Was it 2003? Um, you know, so, and, and you can spend your whole career working on one mission. And if that mission blows up on the launch pad or gets to the gets to where it's going and doesn't work, you know you're kind of you're kind of in a bad position. So this is a really dicey game. Um, and, and Pamela, you were you were talking about education, public outreach, the funding that's going on with Congress and everything. Um, what what an epic problem this is. 
uh, in my never-ending quest to basically piss off everybody, um, I've been hammering the White House. Everybody always, you know, look, I'll admit it. Uh, you know, I am a progressive person. I'm not a conservative person. I'm conservative in some ways, but when it comes to these sorts of things, I'm a progressive. And uh, uh, when it comes to science and all that, and it used to be um, that conservatives were more pro-science and, and progressives were less. Now it's sort of the other way around for various and sundry political reasons. So when I'm hammering people about evolution, about the Big Bang, about that sort of stuff, you know, yeah, I'm hammering the right. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to things like vaccinations, and that sort of thing. I'm hammering the left. Uh, but usually politically, I'm making fun uh, in Congress of the right. Well, now the White House has suddenly decided uh, to, to do something really bizarre, and that is take $300 million out of planetary exploration out of NASA's budget. Uh, and then that, there's that whole thing. And there's also this whole thing about basically taking all of NASA's education funding and moving it off to the Smithsonian and the NSF and these other groups, it's like, that's, that's crazy. What are you talking about? Yeah. It, NASA's, NASA's education system, um, and I've been ensconced in it, um, is, is, you know, it's a bureaucracy. It's got its issues. But it, it, what NASA does and the way it does it is amazing. To take that money away for beyond understanding, because it's a tiny fraction of NASA's budget, and hand it off to all these other people, and it's like, you've got all of these people who are doing a great job and you're basically saying we're taking away your money or you're going to now have to get funded through the Smithsonian, which is a whole different thing. Uh, I well, do not understand that, this. Uh, some of the folks at the Smithsonian have said they aren't going to become a granting agency. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's like, did the White House talk to these people first? And now, and now a lot like, of pushback now from Congress, surprisingly. Yes, and so saying, now... We're relying on Congress to be the sane party here. I know. <laughs> ah! So, <laughs> fine. So, actually... Um, I a, see the a, flames coming out of your head. Oh, my God. So, uh, Heidi Hamill, uh, who is a great astronomer, outer planets astronomer, um, studied the Shoemaker-Levy impacts on Jupiter, studies Uranus, she, and known her forever. She uses Hubble a lot. She had something on Facebook about a, a, a leaked, or a, a basically a draft congressional appropriations bill that got out on Space News. And it basically says, Congress is saying, yeah, look, what the White House did was questionable, which I thought was a great phrase, questionable. It's like, no, it's not questionable. It's, it's bug nut crazy is what it is. And they're saying, look, we're going to restore education. We're going to put the $300 million back into planetary, but we're going to take it out of Earth observing to do climate, you know, that's doing climate science right now. And then I thought, Oh, right. This is the science committee that's got all of these climate change deniers on it. So the political, the political machinations, the gaming, all of this is maddening. Um, and so to have to deal with this level of bug nuttery, uh, uh, when your money, when your funding, when your livelihood and, and the people you employ are depending on it is, is maddening. So I do not blame you for taking this to the streets. And that's why I'm telling people, donate. Don't, don't, donate, okay? Donate to CosmoQuest. It's a good group. Um, and, and there's also this idea that, of, of the citizen science that CosmoQuest is doing. In a sense, that's doing an end run around the gatekeepers as well because um, scientists themselves are the ones getting these research grants and then giving it out to people as opposed to moon mappers and asteroid mappers and, and the other citizen science projects, which are putting the science in the hands of the people. It works really well. And then you guys, you become the gatekeepers, but you know you're good at it. As opposed to slamming the gate shut, you're opening it up. And then you can get this science out to the streets, which is, I think, wonderful. Okay, and that's my, that's my diatribe. So you can set me off on something else if you want. 30, 32 <laughs> well, hours Nancy would be a piece Gress. of cake for me, trust me. Nancy Grez says, for what is she's been watching us for, for hours now, you will never piss me off, Phil. So. <laughs> really? I'm sure you can try. Um, who was that? Nancy Graz, she's been watching us for a few hours oh, now. Oh, okay. I was thinking so, if I knew I'm sure her, you could find something. Something, really, something horribly, ins you know, yeah. I hate kittens. God, they're so ugly and awful and they smell bad. Nice. If I ever turn <laughs> that light off, I'm going to melt. That one's not the one giving off oh, the heat. Okay. That one's, this one gives off heat. I can turn off this okay. one. And I'll turn <laughs> no, off the main room lights. I could start going on like some, some terrible rant insulting things that everybody loves until you raise a certain amount of money and then I'll stop. 
Hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you about how terrible Batman is. Ranting about kittens. Oh, and Harry Potter. Oh, my gosh. It is so ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. See, I've got a lot of... I got a lot of bees in my bonnet right now. <laughs> do tell, do tell. Well, I just did. Oh, also, Bug Girl resents the term bug nut crazy, so you've pissed her off. Good job. Um, I don't care. <laughs> Insects are stupid. Send money. Send money, Bug Girl. I'll stop it. Oh, let me tell you about arthropods. Oh, with their wee thorax. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Sorry, we're dropping things here as we try and turn some lights off because we're dying <laughs> under the heat lamps here. It's yeah, actually, it's pretty warm in here, too. Oh, oh my. the air conditioner came out. That's the problem. The air conditioning broke? It's, it's the tube. It's pumping the hot air back into the room. <laughs> Physics, engineering, good. Um, oh, we have a comment from Jason Kendall going up to the hilltop in NYC to do mega public outreach. So they're going to show amateurs how to do variable stars tonight. So look up Jason Kendall, K-E-N-D-A-L-L, -L, if you're in New York City. Um, I grew up in Staten Island. I, I didn't realize you could see stars. Uh, so he is showing people uh, some amateur astronomy tonight. So go check that out. So, cool. Should be a good night for it. Uh, the moon is a nice crescent and Saturn's up if they want to do that too. So. Hey, Nicole, who's the doll next to Will? Oh, it's, it's Party Spock. Oh, okay. It's Spock wearing Mardi Gras beads. I see. Okay, now that I see the... Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it's just fuzzy enough. I can't see the details on it. All right. Captain Chuck's our little Moon Mappers mascot as well. So I we see. have our little friends here. Um, <laughs> we have a, a question um, from Chris Lawton. Uh, if there's, uh, there is not so much money in people in government pockets right now, so why should science outreach not have to take a hit as well when many other public arenas are under pressure? Well... Sure. Um, that's a good question, and that's a natural reaction, right? We mm -hmm. have less money, so we should, we, you know, everybody's got to take the hit. You know what? Sure, that's fair. Yeah. But it's not just that, um, you know what, we have 5% less money this year, so we're going to give everybody a 5% cut. It doesn't work that way. Um, it, it, some things take a bigger hit than other things. And for example, I mean, NASA's outreach, you, you have to think in terms of percentages. The amount of money that NASA spends on outreach is tiny, tiny, tiny compared to everything else they do. So getting rid of it doesn't make sense. The analogy I've been using for years is that when your hard drive is full, do you delete you know, the text, a couple of text files that are like 5K, or do you delete that 14 gigabyte movie you downloaded or, or ripped or whatever? Like you, you, you look at the big stuff first. It just makes sense. And um, NASA itself, is only a tiny fraction of the U.S. budget. It's only about a half a percent. So you know, NASA, NASA should take its fair share, mm -hmm. but uh, NASA's already cut to the bone. You can't, you can't cut NASA anymore and have it be able to do anything. It just costs a certain amount of money to build uh, satellites, to build the rockets and launch them into space, and to pay your staff to be able to do the job. And anything else you get on top of that allows you to do more, but you can't cut it less than that. So even if you know if you were to cut NASA's budget 10 or 15 percent, they wouldn't be able to do anything. You might as well just cut them out completely. So it doesn't make sense. Also, um, you can think well, and I'm not anti-military. It's just that they are a huge chunk of the buzz budget. You can look at the military and say, where can we tighten this up? Because they get so much money that simply by fixing a few things, you can save all of NASA's budget because the military is so big and NASA is so small. Now, I, I, again, I'm not anti-military. I'm actually quite pro-military. I understand there are bad guys out there and we need, we need you know, soldiers. That's great. Uh, we need defense. But if, if, when, when you're that big, it's much easier to, to fix things at that level. So um, cutting the outreach is such a tiny part of such a tiny part of the federal budget that it doesn't make sense to, to, to cut it. Right. And that's that. Now there's this, and the and the this is that um, it's a it's a little bit of a false dichotomy to say um, uh, we don't have enough money to spend on this this effort. We don't have not enough money to spend on this effort, or we don't not have not enough. Uh, the point Too is many negatives. <laughs> yeah. The point is we have enough money. Don't let 
these people out there say, you know, oh, we have to cut everything to the bone, that is baloney. This country is not broke. Uh, we actually have money to do things. Uh, it, it's just that we're not, uh, you know, and, and I, can, I could get a little political and talk about taxes, I won't bother. That's not the problem. The problem is we have choices on what we can fund. And the choices a lot of the times that this country makes don't make sense. Uh, and not funding science is a terrible idea. Uh, even lowball estimates show that something like a third to a half of our economy depends on scientific research in one way or another. The fact that I'm talking to you through this device with my little microphone here and a, a camera going out into the electromagnetic spectrum and going back into your LCD screen with electrons and, and magnetism and everything, that's all science, folks. This is a trillion dollar industry, the, the web, television, radio, everything like that. It all became real because of science. And the medical industry, agriculture, everything we do depends on science. Cutting the funding to science um, is, is, is basically cutting off your future. It's, it's a bad idea. And because we're a democracy and people vote, we have to tell them and we have to be honest with them get the information out. Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to figure out what happened in the first milliseconds after the Big Bang? Why are we researching genetically modified foods? Why are we researching vaccines to, to, to prevent the next epidemic? Um, you know, people will complain about all the money that's being wasted on this, and then when something goes wrong, they're like, why didn't we spend more money on that? Well, yes. So, in, in my opinion, um, the amount of money we're spending on it is very, very tiny and we can afford it and we can't afford not to spend that money on it. Uh, and that's why uh, we shouldn't be cutting this stuff. So like I said, ranting is not a problem today. We have a, a comment from, from Nancy Grez uh, who says, cutting science, outreach, mm -hmm. and education is tantamount to a company laying off all their R&D, their research and development engineers designing new products for the future, thus guaranteeing future non-competitiveness. And so you're cutting yourself off from the future by by cutting off the education to bring yeah. right. people into the field. The, the phrase is eating your seed corn. You set aside a, a little bit of corn as a farmer that you can plant next year so that you can eat. If you eat that now, great, you're, you're going to live now and the next year you're dead. And science is always, it always has been and always will be our seed corn. We always need to keep uh, something set aside so that we can continue funding the science, which is what our robust economy depends on. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of people out there who seem to think that um, scientists get vast sums of money, that um, there is, um, we're just all whiny butts because we don't get enough. But to look at the big picture, the funding for all of astronomy is a very small percent of 1% of the U.S. budget. The funding for NASA, so now we've broadened it out to include human space flight, earth science, helioscience, planetary science, that is still looking at a fraction of 1% of the U.S. budget. The amount of money NASA spent on science education last year was less than the amount McDonald's spent advertising Happy Meals. Would you rather advertise Happy Meals or advertise science and get it into the classrooms? That, right. that to me, is, is the most abhorrent statistic that I've come across. Well, and, and you know, I make that analogy sometimes as well. You know, we spend more money on pet food. Uh, in, in the U.S., we spend literally five times as much on tobacco products as we do on NASA. Tobacco, we spend about $90 million a year, or $90 billion with a B, $90 billion a year. Mm -hmm. NASA is 18 or less. Actually, I believe the congressional approved appropriation for next year is going to be less than $17 billion. Um, and I got into this argument with some, some uh, libertarian types who say, well, yeah, that's a choice. And, you know, to buying tobacco is a choice. And it's like, absolutely, that is a choice. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to say uh, we need to mandate not spending money on, ta on, on tobacco or anything like that. It's, uh, this isn't a libertarian ar uh, or, or a progressive or conservative argument. This is simply a, a sense of scale, right? People spend five times as much money every year on a product that they know will basically kill them, 
right, versus a twenty percent of that, a fifth of that money, to 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 look to the future, uh, to to help save our planet, to produce science, to learn about the universe. I mean, all of this is good stuff. Uh, so it, it's just a it's 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 just a, a a thing to give you an idea of how that works. And I'm actually let's see, it's one hundred and fifty centimeters. Um, it's uh, I'm doing a thing. Neil Tyson actually talks about this, um, and I think he's right. One percent of 150 is 1.5. So in fact, yeah. So he said you can imagine. This is Neil Tyson used this analogy. I don't know if it was original yeah. with him or not, but I'll use it. You have a dollar bill, and you imagine that this is the amount of money the United States spends every year. And if you ask people, what percentage do we spend on NASA? And they think, well, they're launching all these rockets, and they've got Hubble, and people have a, a lot of people have a hard time with a sense of scale. And they say, oh, I don't know, you know, is it is it a third, a half, a, you know, fifteen percent? Those are the kind of numbers people guess. In fact, if you were to take a pair of scissors and cut the amount of NASA's money out of this dollar bill, it would be a sliver, if I've done my math right, three quarters of a millimeter wide. So it would be something like this. Look at this. I'm defacing. U.S. money, there. It's like that. Okay, that this is even wider than NASA. As Neil puts it, if you were to t if you were to basically defund NASA, that wouldn't even take you to the ink on a dollar bill, right? Wow. That's cr that's silly. We're, the amount of money and NASA gets for what they're doing is probably the best investment that the government does. The, the money that went out in stimulus funding last year, all across the United States, my university benefited from it. We got a brand new science building. That one nice. outflow of money was greater than all the funding NASA has gotten throughout all of the past 60 years of, of right. NASA's exploration. Right. And you just have to keep a sense of scale. Again, like with the tobacco, um, the amount of money we were spending just on air conditioning in Afghanistan was yeah. bigger than NASA's budget, something like that, or comparable to it, something like that. And again, I know that's necessary. It's just to give you an idea of the kind of expenditures we're talking about, the, of what we spend on defense versus what we spend on science versus what we spend on this and that, and, and, the, and the entitlements and everything. When you really look at the, at the federal budget, um, NASA's is a minuscule part of it, and the amount of outreach they do is a minuscule part of that. And what Pamela gets for her group at Southern Illinois University uh, is is a tiny tiny fraction of that, and yet what you guys can do with this money is huge. The footprint is yeah. enormous. We run on about four hundred thousand dollars a year. For that four hundred thousand dollars a year, we have two full time staff, uh, a bunch of part time staff. I'm eighty percent because I spend the other twenty percent of my time um, getting paid off of books and speaker fees and things like that. And I don't want to charge the university money. I don't have to. I will work all the hours I need to. Um, and then we have our graduate student, we have, we do all of these different things and with sequestration, everyone across the board had to cut 9%. Now the problem is, when you run projects like ours, pretty much all of your funding goes to humans. Everything we do is online. Um, so our costs are, uh, they fall into three basic categories. There are salaries, there is medical insurance, and then there's travel funding. And there's a very small fraction that goes to everyday software costs, text expander, screencasting software. Um, every few years we do need to buy computers. Um, but the bulk of the money goes to paying our human salary, making sure that they have medical insurance, and then traveling to make sure that we can educate you face-to-face -face periodically. And so we stretch that $400,000 absolutely as far as we can. And that's the thing with all of science education is we're all cut that tightly with our budgets. Postage has been re re uh, removed from the budget a lot of the time. And, and so anytime you cut science education, you're telling people you no longer have a job. And people think, oh, we're just cutting people from doing wasteful science. Who needs to know about that? Now, what you're doing is you're firing people, and you're telling them that their curiosity isn't worth paying for, that their desire to understand our universe has no meaning. We fund science so that we can understand our universe. When Maxwell came up with the Maxwell's equations, um, he didn't know those would eventually lead to cell phones and LCD projectors. Even the radio. 
Yeah. I mean, radar stuff that was used. I mean, if, if you, uh, sat down, sat down with a bunch of people and said, look, we need to invent a, a communication device that works over thousands of miles without Maxwell's equations, they may not have come up with the radio. Um, but that was just pure research. And it's the pure research. It's the stuff that people don't know how to apply yet, that people keep trying to zero. And, you know, that's the stuff that someday has the greatest potential to do something great that we can't anticipate. Right. And I just checked the donation page. Let me refresh it again to make sure. But since I've been on, there's been le less than $300 donated. So... Um, I know there are a lot of folks out there on Twitter following me, and you know if you if you give up your second cup of coffee for the day, you know, whatever you spend it at Starbucks for that that cup and donate it, that would help a lot. <laughs> um, and of course, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm talking to you guys. Maybe I should just tweet it again. Um, you know, I'll do that here. Go on the Twitter. Twitters. Type, type, type. <laughs> um, Ray Sanders points out, uh, isn't the return on investment something like six or seven dollars per dollar spent on NASA? That that's what it's estimated to be by people who do economics research. That by spending one dollar to do basic science research, uh, we are able to discover new technologies that innovate our economy to uh, return six or seven dollars. Um, and that's I kind of awesome to think about. Right. And it's coming in all sorts of different places, from digital detectors that you use in the camera in your cell phone to uh, this iPad device, the micronization. Satellites work on a few watts, not a few hundred watts, not a few megawatts. They work on a few watts. So we need to build low-power, um, high-capability processors and sensors and that's the same sort of technology you have to develop if you want very small com consumer electronics. It's that, amazing how everything fits together, but people don't generally think that way. So we'd encourage you to mm -hmm. think about the entire economy, how science plays such an amazing role in helping to reduce costs, increase efficiencies. And yeah, we all know email is probably the worst great invention ever, um, but all of this has been enabled due to basic research at one level or another. You mentioned one of my favorites. Um, well, Nicole, you mentioned Maxwell doing his research on his own. Um, I, I use that one a lot. Sagan wrote about that in Parade mm -hmm. Magazine years ago, and I think it's a phenomenal example of, you know, he basically invented uh, electronics. <laughs> yeah. uh, not the quantum part of it, but just, you know, because of his electromagnetic theorem, uh, the, the four equations, Maxwell's equations, uh, describing electricity and magnetism, you know, our modern culture is all is all based on that because of electricity. Um, and uh, I use that one a lot, too, because it's such a perfect example. And Pamela, you mentioned cameras. Yeah. And that's one um, I heard and then started researching it and found out it's actually true. Uh, when they were building Hubble in the 1980s, or roughly 1970s and 80s, one of the, the, the workhorse cameras was this wide-field planetary camera. It was sort of the camera on Hubble that was going to take all the amazing uh, observations. And the problem was they wanted it to be digital, but the technology was brand new. These CCDs, these charge couple devices, yeah. digital detectors. And um, they couldn't, they, the, the, the technology to make them clean enough to be able to take good ast astronomical observations need um, to be very, very clean. You don't want a lot of noisy pictures. You want to be able to see what you're seeing. And um, the technology to develop these detectors was brand new. So they had to learn how to make them cheaper uh, and better, use less power, as Pamela mentioned. And they, they made, I, I want to say, thousands of these chips learning how to do it. And by the time they had gotten out of, you know, they, they built the first generation, which, it, it, which let me tell you, they, these were some of the best cameras ever built at that time. Um, they had lowered the price, the power consumption, and raised the quality of them so much that it became easier for commercial companies to build these detectors smaller, more efficient, using less power. Um, what's funny now is you, you look at like the advanced camera for surveys or the Wide Field Planetary Camera 3, the third generation one, and they totally blow the original WIFPIC, the Wide Field Planetary Camera, out of the water. But again, you know, they couldn't have built these amazing detectors without having figured out how to do it in the first place. And now they did it so well 
that we have cameras everywhere, and that may be, you know, you can argue now with the latest uh, findings about PRISM and all that, whether that's a good or a bad thing, <laughs> but uh, they're in phones, they're in webcams, they're everywhere. And this is a huge, a multi-billion dollar industry um, that, that has sort of a, it, it didn't have its start with, with Hubble Space Telescope, but there, it is a direct descendant of the work done on Hubble. And I don't think anybody necessarily predicted that. Um, but because NASA built these detectors, you have one in your camera. You are watching this hangout because of that. That's where science funding gets you. Places you don't know you're going to go, but that turn out to be awesome. And that's, that's why I tell people, you got to keep doing this. We don't know where we're going to go. If we knew where we were going to go, it wouldn't be research. It wouldn't be experimentation. I used to have a bumper sticker that said that. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. And, and there's That's a terrible this... bumper sticker because somebody's following you. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know where I'm going. You know, where I get will be cool. Um, so, so one of the more depressing things I, was, I recently heard was um, so back during the space race back when we were uh, basically trying to race the Soviet Union here there and everywhere across our solar system vast sums of money were sank into science education science research into building an American army of scientists and I, I heard a couple weeks ago while I was in Washington, D.C., look, the space race is over. We won. It's time to send the astronomers home. And Who said that? It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the things. And you heard this, a similar thing when you were at the NSF town. Uh, yeah, the NSF town hall at the latest AAS meeting, they, they reiterated the point you heard um, in D.C. is that they're looking to um, stop funding a lot of soft money positions. Which is both of us. Um, you know, they're stuck in the situation where they're saying, well, the NSF doesn't have as much money, we can't keep supporting these, these researchers. And the universities are saying, we don't have as much money, we can't keep supporting these researchers either. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically is they're looking to just defund the research positions when there's already a lot of people coming out with science training um, that uh, aren't going to find jobs in the field. So, so the no, people wait who a go... second, Nicole, I'm sorry. Yeah? These were people at the NSF saying this, or this was politicians yes. Yes. telling people at the NSF this? This is coming from the NSF. I don't High levels at the NSF are passing down the food chain yeah. right. the message that there are too okay. many soft money researchers, people who aren't teaching faculty. Um, if you are tenured or tenure track, nine months of your salary is paid by your institution to be there as someone who teaches courses. But there are research centers. There's the Space Telescope Institute. There's the Southwest Research Institute. There's the Planetary Science Institute, the Lunar and Planetary Institute. There are all these science institutes all across the United States. And the people doing cutting edge research, often planetary science research at these centers, these aren't tenured track, tenured teaching faculty. These are people who spend every day trying to understand the surfaces of other worlds, the science of how stars work, and everything near and far in the sky. And the message that's coming down from on high is we've got too many scientists who aren't teaching faculty. We need to weed them out. And that message means people like Nicole and I aren't valued because we're not teaching faculty. Or research, tenured research faculty. Yeah, or yeah. tenured research faculty. Yeah. And so these cuts, these ways of looking at grants are specifically targeted at programs like we run, where we put, put all of our effort into teaching the general public. Mm. Also, um, I was sitting there next to my friend Gail, I brought up before, uh, a lot of, there are a lot of couples in astronomy uh, and in the sciences in general, and often there's not enough money in, in an institution to hire both people who are in similar fields, and so one person may have a tenure track position while the other's on soft money. And so that is going to make that problem a lot harder, where couples are going to have to basically split up or only one can find a job in the field. Uh, that's another thing that would get hit from soft money research uh, positions being cut as well. So my friend Gail, who uh, her, her significant other is also an astronomer, just kind of shook her head because that hits them too. And, and so this is putting us in a position where we need to spend the next six months building new projects, but also spending 
our after work hours writing grants to not the federal government, not to the National Science Foundation, but to corporations, to foundations, and we need to redirect how we bring in money. Right. And we're here today asking you, do you value us? Will you support us? And will you help us bridge those six months so that we can find that next source of funding to keep doing what we're doing? We thought we were good. We thought we were safe. We had seven different funding sources, but they were all, su they were all funding sources through NASA that it looks like are going to evaporate. Or in a second. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Guido Bieber wants to uh, remind everybody that micro donations can help. Yes. Uh, even a little bit. Somebody earlier pointed out that if, if everyone of Phil's Twitter followers, uh, even the bots, <laughs> donated $1, <laughs> we would reach our goal. So, you know, there you go. That's if you have a true. few bucks, that's cool. Yeah, good luck getting the porn bots to donate a dollar, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so, the, the way I look at it is I buy McDonald's once a week, or at least I used to, but I recently started supporting more and more Kickstarters because I realized what a powerful thing this was. Me too. And so while I still go out Tuesday night with the girls and we get Mexican food, that McDonald's bag that used to get abandoned in my husband's car, much to his dismay, is becoming a much less frequent occurrence because... I give out and now I'm asking you to give as well and yeah, so there's the link uh, on the video we can't update the YouTube description so it's up here on the screen um, cosmoquest.org slash donate so, so consider easy. giving your coffee budget for the week consider giving your junk food budget for the week um, our students cost twelve dollars and fifty cents an hour that's it and that's both graduate students and undergraduates because our undergrads are so good I pay them the same way we pay our graduate students um, help that's all I can really say help right. you know I'll, I'll, I have this discussion a lot with folks and because um, what I'll do is um, uh, I'll tweet about some Kickstarter project or something you know or, or you know this person's looking for money or whatever they're always uh, a, a huge number of people with their hand out, of course, um, especially with the, the economy and uh, um, and I sometimes get people saying, "Why should I give money to what you want me to give? I've got all these other things." Absolutely true. You know what? I've I've got uh, a friend of mine who who wants to make us a, a second season of her web series, My Gimpy Life. Teal Share. Um, her web series is really funny, and I really liked it. So I tweeted. I tweeted about it several times actually because I liked it. If you don't yeah. want to get money to that because it's a web series, that's fine. But you know, I, you're going to go to the movies sometime, probably. If you're if you're watching this, you're probably a movie goer. You're going to go to the theater and you're going to watch a movie that's going to be crappy. Um, I could I could boy could I give you a list of movies that I really wish I hadn't gone to the theater to see. Um, and that's that's ten bucks right there. At, you know, at, at at best. And you know, I'd rather give that money to somebody I know is going to make a good, entertaining web series. Then another, uh, you know, Hollywood blockbuster. Where at the end, I'm just going to kind of go, oh, "It's two hours of my life. I'm not going to get back." Um, there's always these kind of choices you're going to make. Um, for me, um, you know, I don't, I don't use cash that much anymore. I use my credit card for everything. But you know, I, I used to always, when I'd use cash, I would take that change and throw it into a jar, wait till the jar was full, and then put it, you know, I put it in my daughter's bank account when she was little, um, or you know that's that's going to be twenty bucks. That's twenty. That's twenty free dollars. Um, who needs that money? You could give it to Kiva.org, the micro the micro donation. Yeah, that's a uh, good site. one. But you know, twenty bucks to you guys at CosmoQuest means a lot. Uh, twenty bucks. There's yeah. There's always going to be choices for for these different things. Um, but but at the end of the day, what we can choose to do, each one of us, is to define the future we want by yes. giving to the things we value. That's so, the point I was about to make. No, I mean you got it. That's it. Out of his mouth. <laughs> Except you, you said it in five seconds when I was like going all over the place. <laughs> but yeah, it, you have to choose what you want to give your money to, um, and it can be you know it can be entertainment, it can be all these different things. In this case, you are giving money to science and to educating the public about science. And if you're watching this, you like science. If you're following me on Twitter, it's not because of my puns. I'm pretty sure. Um, occasionally it is. Occasionally, yeah, sure. No comment. Um, <laughs> uh, it's probably because I'm I'm ticked off about something else, and I'm tweeting about it, getting in a Twitter war with somebody. Um, but that that's where I think um, 
just even small amounts of money, a few bucks here and there, people can afford it. I, I know there are people who can't. Absolutely. You know, that's fine. Um, but if, you're, if, if you are going, and I, God, I sound like a PBS donation drive, and it's like, get on with, you know, upstairs, downstairs, or whatever. Um, but, but honestly, uh, it, 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 make the choice. Make the choice. Yeah. You can choose this, you can choose something else. But in this case, what you're choosing to do is to educate people about science. And I've seen what Pamela does. I've seen what Nicole does. As a matter of fact, Nicole's coming to Boulder uh, in a couple of months. To, uh, to do some demos with uh, a science festival that my wife and I are throwing here. Boulder is this enormous center for science, and yet there's not a real celebration of it. And we said, well, we'll do it. And so we're going to have some speakers and things. We haven't quite announced this officially yet, but we're going to have Nicole come out and, uh, and do... Uh, are you making a comment? Yeah, I maybe. actually... Uh, Marcella emailed me about this the other day. I... I, I... Yes. We'll happily do any demo you want, but uh, definitely want to do a comment. That that's a big crowd pleaser. Want to do uh, craters because we can make a little destruction in a bowl, uh, and then some kind of invisible light thing. Depending on where I'm set up, I might do a bring a little Faraday cage with me or the the UV sensitive beads. Um, but uh, I I have all kinds of science demos that I love doing. So and the kids, wherever you want me to go with it. The kids love all this stuff. Um, yeah. Nicole did the, the make adults a comment. love all this stuff. Yeah, well, it's fun. I've done it too. And Nicole did this at um, Dragon Con a couple of years ago, uh, making the comet, and um, that was it was wonderful. The, the 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 kids and the adults love it. Um, that's where your money's going, right? When you see a kid's face light up when they see how yes. something is done, when they understand something, uh, yeah, that's worth a couple of bucks. Come on. So uh, I'm all for this. I I think people. I I don't know. Let's see what see what anybody responded to my throw money at Pamela and Nicole. Throw money, Nicole and Pamela. Yes, people are retweeting it. Give up your second cup of coffee and donate, please. Um, and, and one of the things, so I just opened up my email, and one of the things that I love but also makes me sad is we've been getting more retweets and more shares than we've been getting dollars. That's not surprising. And and what that tells me is one, people care. Two, the economy sucks. Um, and and. Well, it's a selection Three. effect, too. People are watching yeah. this. They probably already supported you. Yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> so, so help get people who don't necessarily already know about us watching this and getting to know us. Um, we're going to be bringing on all sorts of guests all throughout the weekend. Um, our next hour, I believe, is with Emily? Yes, but first we have... Uh... We've run over, but we'll have uh, Gregory Sivakov next. Okay, so, so we're there. now running behind, which always happens when Phil is here. Really? It's okay, it's we love you. We'll just, we'll just, seven minutes. we'll just go for 32 hours and 15 minutes. It's fine. <laughs> oh, we, were we supposed to end at the top of the hour? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's all good. Um, I, well, let me just jump in and say very quickly, Bug Girl said she won't give money until I apologize for slandering insects. Um, all right, fine. Insects are awesome. Very tasty, some of them as well. So <laughs> that's okay because Bug Girl has many bug bugs. recipes that she can share. Okay, we so love now, Bug Girl. She She'll be on tomorrow. Oh, okay, she's donating her time. That's good. <laughs> Yay! So thank you, Phil. Is that where you want to end eating bugs? Sure. Hey, okay. yeah. So look, hey, tell you what, people, um, science is cool, and I I completely support Cosmo Quest. Now, of course, I'm an advisor for the group. But I wouldn't be if I didn't support them. Hello. And uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, and with, I love Pamela and Nicole very much. And that's why I'm doing this. So uh, if you can help out in any way, please do it. And look, if you want to make more Science is Cool pictures, that's fine with me. Um, send send them to send them to me or tweet them or something, and, and we'll send yeah, them. Yeah, I've out seen there. them coming up. Um, I'm keeping track of a lot of things. So do tweet them right at Phil, and uh, <laughs> he can deal with them. So. <laughs> Actually, I think you can add them to the event. Yes, some one of them's been added to the right to the event. Um, oh, really? There's there's one of you on the podium at TAM, and it says Phil Plate says donate. It's really awesome. So go Ooh, check that out. Yeah, if you're watching the main event on uh, on um, Google Plus, you can just add the photo right there. But keep it clean. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for that. So now. thank you, Phil. This this has been awesome. And hugs. yes, virtual oh. hugs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. And and as always, it's been awesome having you on. And um, thanks for being a part of what we do every day. Pleasure is all mine. What you guys do is amazing. So let's keep uh, let's keep going. I'll be very curious to see what's going to happen around hour thirty. Oh, it'll be fun. <laughs> it'll be glorious. It'll be that'll be around the time we have the uh, Beyond the Wall podcast on. Yeah, so we're so just going to have be a good even time. Better. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Cool, Phil. Thank you so right. much. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye. Give money. Bye. Throw, throw money at them. Do it now. Do it. <laughs> Shower. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Tim, you can send along Greg. So we.